Church leaders need no, intentional development to help them discover their capacity. When studying leadership, it can be easy to stare at some people with large numbers. Successions lose momentum and lose potential because the parent generation that's about to hand it off really doesn't uh, prepare well. Hello, and welcome to the Vanderbloom and Leadership Podcast, where we talk about how to build, run, and keep a great team. I'm your host, Holly Tate. On today's episode, I am excited for you to get to hear William talk with Warren Bird. Warren is the lead researcher at Leadership Network, and he's also William's co-author on the book Next, Pastoral Succession That Works. One year ago, William and Warren wrote Next, and it has sold thousands of copies and helped thousands of pastors around the world think about the most critical question that they will answer as a church leader, and that is, who will lead after me? In this episode, William and Warren talk about the trends that they're seeing in pastoral succession around the globe. So be sure to tweet your takeaways along with us using the hashtag Vandercast. That's hashtag Vandercast. Let's jump in. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm with my friend Warren Bird. We're recording today on a Friday uh, at 2 o'clock. And if you knew us uh, well, you would know that for the better part of a year, maybe even a little longer than a year, every Friday at 2 o'clock, Warren and I were on the phone together working on the uh, authoring of Next, Pastoral Succession That Works. So this is kind of a blast for the past for me. And uh Frankly, of all the pastors I interview, uh, Warren's one of the few who, before we go on the podcast, says, can we pray together before we do this? So it's, it's just great to have you on today, Warren. Thanks for joining us. William, uh, great. And and I, you and I put more time into that book than I've done on any of my 28 books. And, and I think the payoff of the stories that we captured, the way we uh, identified trends, the research that we did— explains why the book has gotten such an amazing response. Well, I, I, I don't want to turn this into an infomercial for the book, but I did I did tell you early on, I'm pretty sure my mother will buy the first hundred copies, but after that, I don't know what's going to happen. And it, we're in a, they've run through several printings. We're in paperback now. The, the uh, book just continues to prove to do well. And more importantly, I'm continuing to hear stories of pastors that are thankful that that, that they're able to have a conversation with their board now without it being weird. That, that For me, that was the number one purpose of the book. So thanks so much for helping get that done and, and for all the work you're doing. Uh, you're writing another book right now um, at, that'll be out soon. And th- you've written 28 books. Is that right? Wow. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the one coming out soon is uh, with Will Mancini. Uh, the name is God Dreams, and it has to do with uh, planning Visionary planning. How do you do it in a manageable way? It seems like that concept was really hot for a while, and for some reason people pushed away other than to have a vision or mission statement, which which is miles from how do I help my church see the picture of what why we're uniquely here and what God wants us to do. Well, that sounds like something everybody's going to want to read. Uh, we've had a number of requests since the podcast started for the, for you and I to be a guest, and it feels a little like I've got spotlight issues to talk about my own book on a podcast, but it sounds like people really want to talk about this. So why don't we just kick off? I I remember the first debates we had, and uh, we won't go into who was on what side of what, but uh, was how we start this conversation, how we start the book. And we stumbled across a line that uh, has really kind of coined every succession conversation I have, and that is every pastor is an interim pastor. And, and I'll just explain that for a second, and then I'll ask you a couple questions, Warren. But if you're listening today, you are an interim pastor. Well, let me carry that just a little further. William. Wherever I go, I mean, I, I was in Kenya, and I can use this line everywhere to say, I, I don't know your churches and your worlds, but I do know one thing about this. You and everyone else who serves with you are interim. Wow. And there's usually like this pause of like, Oh, you're right. And then you you give a quick, you know, 2 Timothy 2, 2, train others who train others who train others who train others. And everybody's hooked to say, you know, we really should be having these conversations. Well, and it doesn't even dawn on people. But, I mean, really, there are only three ways that your pastorate will end. 
Uh, you could be the pastor that runs your church into the ground and closes it. That, that's not cool. Um, you could be the pastor that's pastor of the church when Jesus returns. That'd be really cool. Kind of hard to plan for, though. Um, the only other option I see is somebody's going to come after you. And, and the way the church talks about succession historically has been uh, in you know, very secretive ways. No one really wants to talk about it. It's almost like the uh, relationship between a pastor and a church is more like family than it is like employer and employee. And there's a lot of good to that. But, but when it comes time to say, well, let's talk about when I might not be here, it's almost like dad sitting down at the dinner table saying, let's talk about when I'm not going to be here anymore. And half the kids think you've got a terminal illness and the other half think you're running off with another woman. And it, the whole conversation turns into a big anxiety panic attack. Same with churches and boards. If you bring up succession, it's going to sound like you're getting ready to leave or you've done something wrong and uh, nobody quite knows how to digest that. So hopefully the book... And- and William, that's even worse in some cultures. You, you and I were together interviewing Rick Warren about his succession plan, and afterwards a pastor from Kenya came up and said, you try saying that in my country. And I said, why? And he says, because to talk about succession is to wish someone's death. And, and I said, well, how about if we do that? And he actually brought me over to Kenya, and he set me up with the conversations with, he, he found all the largest attendance churches, he, his particular peer group uh, in Nairobi, and we went group by group uh, t- getting this subject out on the ground, and every single one was grateful that we had helped them begin the conversation, and we never did it with them alone. We did it with a board member, uh, uh, their executive pastor, several people together uh, going one group from this church, one group from another church. That's fantastic. I I, uh, know a lot of people that listen to the podcast have read the book, so let's talk a little bit about what's happened since the book's come out. It's been over a year now, and uh, we've had a chance to watch and see. What are some of the things that you've noticed uh, since the book has come out? And is there anything that's surprised you since the book has come out? I've been surprised by how many father-son or in the family successions happen uh, poorly. Hmm. That that it's easy to hand the baton to one of your kids and to assume that your kid's going to take it. Um, and and it's it's so easy not to put much thought into it and and in a way because it's your kid who all is going to object and want to throw out you know uh, fire the the new pastor and all and and a lot of successions lose momentum and lose potential because the parent generation that's about to hand it off really doesn't uh, prepare well hmm. I, I know we had uh, we've had a really high uh, we've had a really high spike in the number of churches that have said, come in and help us do succession planning. And it's usually not with the guy who's 67 or 8 years old. Um, we had one rather large church where the pastor is in his 50s. Uh, his son was on staff. And, I, it, you know, from the day I met the son, I thought, well, that's the guy. Clearly, this is what's going to happen. But when the book came out, uh, the pastor called me and said, I, I don't usually read a whole lot, but I read this and I'm ready to talk. Let's talk. So I go in to help with the father-son conversations. Uh, After talking to the son for a while, it got clear that maybe he wanted a way to say that this might not be right, Uh, not because he doesn't love dad, but because it's just not a cultural match. And then I met with the board separately, and the board said, we love our pastor, and we hate to tell him no, but we don't know that this would be right. Long story short, they decided all together this wouldn't be right, but have we not had a succession planning conversation, they would have all, for lack of a, a venue to talk about what's hard to talk about, they would have gone forward, and, and it could have been disastrous. Now the, the son is a senior pastor at a, a booming large church and doing well, and the father's got a different plan, and uh, it, was, it was kind of crisis averted just because we took time to sit down. I never foresaw that kind of thing happening when we wrote the book. Another one I didn't foresee was district superintendent types giving it to all their pastors. Now, uh, that's, that's of all sizes. And, and then I've been asked to do a number of, of uh, like, video chats 
where it's their district or, or equivalent gathering. It's pastors as a group who read it and and talking to all of them about even in an appointment system, what can you do to best prepare your congregation for who will succeed you to best prepare yourself for your next succession? None of this was retirement. Well, I suppose a few in the room were. But all of them were just like, how do we hand the baton better? I, we need to get better at this. And I've been like, wow. Yeah, it's pretty pretty amazing to see. And uh, you know, usually you'll find a, a, an entire church board will buy it together and read it together. And, and it just gives that, that venue for a conversation. One, one thing that I've not been privy to that I'd love to hear you talk about, Warren, is you've done a lot of work. Uh, thinking about this internationally. We did some of that with the book, but really since then, it's kind of branched out some. Tell, tell the listeners out there what you've been learning about the international community and succession. Well, part of the trigger for me originally getting interested in this topic was Korea, which kind of was the first wave of really large churches, and so many of those pastors reaching the retirement age and the successions not working well and thinking, goodness, uh, you know, it, do we need to learn something? Is there, is there some wisdom that can be passed on? Is there something in Scripture that's, that uh, we're not highlighting enough in how we do our ministry? And then I keep a list of global megachurches at leadnet.org slash world, and uh, I track the pastor's ages there and their movements and thinking, wow, this is not working well. Now, I mentioned the example of being invited over to Kenya. Uh, and what, what surprises me when I've been in several international contexts is you think, okay, well, this is an American book. Uh, well, first, they no worries about getting the book because the e-books, Ubiquity, uh, is possible to download wherever you are. And second, the stories have been parallel enough. When I was just, let me use Kenya again, because I must have done, I don't know, 12, maybe 15 different churches. William, I think I actually emailed you on a couple of these days. It's like, these are the exactly the same stories that we hear in the States. The world, in many ways, is the same over in terms of uh, preparing and planning uh, for succession. Well, and I, I think uh, I've used this phrase before, but I think when we first started talking about this, if you looked at pastors' ages, if you took a long enough look at it, you could realize in every industry in America, the baby boomer retirement's going to have major ripples. Uh, but I don't think anybody's really thought about how serious it is for, for pastors. Uh, now, we wrote the book for people who are young and maybe going to stay at a place five years and then move to the next thing. They need a succession plan. But but really, the, the, the impending retirement of the baby boom generation and just the lack of people that are in the generation right behind them, there just weren't as many babies born, makes for a real problem. And I, I, I likened it to uh, there's been an earthquake 100 miles out to sea, and there's a wave coming, and some people are starting to see that and, and address it. And I, I'm just thrilled to death to see that people are— uh, latching on. I, I wanted to... Let, 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 me, let me push back on that just a second. Yes, the retirement is the low-hanging fruit. It's the tsunami coming, and we've got to deal with it. But I can't tell you how many uh, people are like, hey, you know, I, the, the, the church is going great, but my parents are aging. And Sean Lovejoy, case in point, I need to move to where my parents are several hundred miles away. I need to pass the baton. I need to do it well. Or someone who gets a sense of different calling. You know, I've loved this church work, or maybe, maybe I haven't. And, and I'm, I'm moving in a different direction. I love this church. How do I pass the baton well? So one of my surprises has been how many non-retirement cases of people who have, have said, this book really helped me figure out how to prepare well for the succession. That's a, that's a beautiful case in point. In fact, Sean was our very, he was our third client, and we've done a ton of work for him, and then we handled the search to uh, find his successor. And, and a, a lot of what happened was this conversation in succession led him to a place to, how, how do you as a founding pastor of a church that's thriving uh, step aside in your mid forties without people thinking, did you steal something or did you, <laughs> the succession conversation uh, liberates people into being able to do that. I, I wanted to share, um, a chapter in the book that I wanted to write that we knew we couldn't. 
And uh, it was a chapter about what do we do about the pastor's wife? And uh, we talked a little bit about it, but I, I'll tell you, I can't, so many of the, the uh, without getting into gory details, so many of the failed high-profile successions that we looked at, you could draw a straight line back to the pastor's wife being very unhappy and, and frankly, being something that wasn't dealt with on the front end in a positive way that just caused a wound to fester. And, and on the flip side, a story I will tell, and I'm, Warren, I'm going to count on you to correct me if I get it wrong. Uh, when the outgoing pastor's wife is committed to the succession, it is pure gold. And, and I'm thinking particularly of First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. Uh, the, Dr. Truett and Dr. Chris Wall, you would know the exact number, Warren, but the two of them together— uh, almost got to a century of leadership at First Baptist Dallas. 50 years for Truett, 48 for Criswell. Now, when Dr. Criswell arrived, uh, we talked to some people that said, you know, when he got here, uh, the third year is always the hard year. Pastors, if you don't know that and you're in your third year and you're about to quit, at least wait till year four because year three is just kind of stinky. Uh, and in that third year, it was a little bit bumpy for Dr. Criswell. And one of the ways things turned around was a story that we heard that Ms. Truett, called Ms. Criswell and said, how do we figure this out? How do we make this work? And that that was a kind of a turning point. What a great word for people out there who, uh, if, if you're a male pastor and you're married, uh, what a great word of wisdom for you as you plan for your succession to do it as a couple and not just as a guy on their own. You got anything to say to that, Warren? Yeah, and, and these are real strong words, uh, and, and it's to the males who are listening, who are the husbands, who are the pastors. I can't tell you how many times I've talked with someone about his succession, and I've said, now, to what extent is your wife involved in this, and should we talk with her? Oh, she's fine. It's great. It's everything. Only for us to discover it was not fine. She did not feel communicated with, honored, uh, treated, considered, uh, and, and so much hurt could have been avoided had not men been so insensitive and said, well, you know, maybe maybe I do need to connect my wife with other wives who have gone through succession or who, who have this uh, done some aspect of it. So, so uh, guys who are listening... Do not, and if you're approaching some kind of succession, do not assume that everything is great with your wife. Go the extra mile to find peers, connections, mentor groups, uh, friends uh, to help make the succession successful for and, her. And I'd go a step further with one more piece of advice, and that would be as you're approaching the time that you're going to leave, whether you're a young pastor that's getting ready to move to a new place or to move out of ministry or a retirement, whatever it is, begin thinking about how your spouse is going to spend their time and energy. Because I, you know, we, I know we have female pastor listeners, and so no, no slight toward them, but most pastors are males, and most of them are married, so most of the time you're talking about a pastor with a wife. And, and I don't know a profession that draws a spouse in as much as ministry, causes them to plant roots in the place of work as much as ministry. You're doing your spiritual journey there. You're doing your relational journey there. You're, you're, doing, you're marrying off your kids there. You're burying your friends there. And then you're asked to pick up and leave and let someone else step in. That's hard. And if your spouse doesn't have something to do, it's going to be even harder. I was visiting with a, a large church sometime back doing a succession consultation. We always visit with the spouse when we, when we go. And I said, so how involved are you and how involved does the next pastor's wife need to be? And she said, I'm not really involved. I mean, you know, in the early days when, when the church was smaller, I did a lot of things, but anymore, I just don't do much. And I said, okay, so what, what, like on Sundays, do you do anything? Not really. And her husband said, well, you know, you do run the Visitor Connect Center. I thought, that's kind of important. And then I said, okay, what about during the week? Do you do anything? Well, not really. And then the husband said, well, we did have the whole staff over for dinner last night. And that's like 100 people. So I, you know, as we walked through, the, the reality was, even though your spouse might think they're not that attached to the church, I bet they're more attached than you think. And you need to go there, go deep, and make sure that there'll be something to do once that piece of life has changed. Yeah. And, and just like 
we've found that the one of the top three reasons why people don't hand off the baton, they keep hanging on, is because they they don't the pastor doesn't have a dream for what's next. And and there's all this effort to help say, well, you know, what are some passions God has given you? What are some missions or other experiences or teaching or or whatever? Likewise, that same, if you will, career uh, dreaming, uh, next step dreaming. As one pastor's, uh, in this case, wife told me, she said, said, well, my husband had a new place to plant, and I didn't have anywhere to plant down. Mm. And I thought, oh, I get it. I get yeah, it. And it was rough. Yeah, there's, there's pioneers and settlers in every couple. One of them's a pioneer and the other's a settler. And when the settler has to get up and leave... They got to take some time to pull up roots, and it, it's tougher than anybody anticipates. Hey, shifting gears, Warren, uh, one thing our listeners may not know that you and I and our organizations partner together on is church compensation. Uh, this is a fascinating conversation. I'm seeing, I say it all the time, listeners are probably tired of hearing it, I'm seeing churches hire fewer people but pay them better money. And they're hiring people who can multiply leadership, not just a singles pastor or Uh, a specialist in an area. And so tell our listeners a little bit about the study that we did and the study that's coming up. Fill fill us in on what we've done there. The key word is the link leadnet.org slash salary. And first, let's talk about the compensation analysis. That's if you're a church and you're saying, well, we're going to hire a campus pastor, we're going to hire a whatever. What is paid for people at that level at that size uh at that uh, geography or you know if it's urban or, or whatever and and probably more uh comparison points than anyone else well i don't, don't want to say probably we have it between the two of us and we partner together uh to do those compens uh tailored compensation analysis and you can find the link for it at leadnet.org slash salary. There's also a report which the Vanderbloom uh search group uh sponsors and leadership network produces uh is the large church salary report. And that's things like uh okay, you know, what's the difference between the highest paid person on average and the second highest paid person. And that free executive summary at that same web link, leadnet.org slash salary, uh, gives you guidelines. Now, are these guidelines for these different ratios and benchmarks, are they in the Bible? No. Can you change them for your church? Of course. But most people at least want to know what what's the comparison point? What's What's out there? How are others handling it? Uh, and this illustrated free uh, download uh, is uh, just go to leadnet.org slash salary and you'll see it. You'll also see the option if you want to be part of the 2016 salary survey and those who participate get all kinds of extra perks and feedback and, of course, uh, information that you can use about your own church. That's great to know, and I uh, can't tell you, it's one of the most common questions we get is, how much should I pay my pastor? In fact, we usually have guests on the podcast, but from time to time we do in-house podcasts, and the in-house podcast titled, What Should I Pay My Pastor? It probably got downloaded more than uh, any, well, certainly more than any but a few podcast episodes that we've had in the first 30 days that was out. It was It was remarkable how much of a need there is for people to find out what the right amount is. So we, uh, along with LeadNet, are happy to help with that study. We also bought an incredible amount of data so that we can supplement that study with even more research to be able to help you get a really granular idea of what you should pay your pastor in the place that you live. Um, So hope that's a help to you all. And William, you don't just, just to clarify, you don't just do senior pastor. Let's say someone says, I've got an executive pastor, which is, or church administrator, which is typically the second highest uh, paid position. You want to know, well, well, what's kind of the going rate for that? And given this person's experience, context, and so forth. That's right. That's right. Well, Warren, uh, so we always kind of put our guests uh, on the spot with three questions uh, just to hear common answers. Uh, The first question I want to ask you is, Tell us a book you're reading that really has you excited. There are only two rules. You can't say the Bible, and you can't say good to great. 
Great. Yeah. Um, my wife and I uh, read a book uh, just after breakfast each day, and we're right now working through a short biography of Jonathan Edwards, uh, and it's by Mark Knoll, and it's it's fascinating to know how just 200 years ago, the early 1700s, a little longer, um, how life was for clergy, how they dealt with challenges, problems. Uh, uh, the guy had 10 kids, and, and their way of mentoring other pastors was to take one in as a boarder. Uh, and so that's how they did internships and residencies back then. You lived with the pastor uh, in, in the family. So that's been fascinating. That's awesome. How, how about, uh, second question, what's an app that's on your phone right now that you're, you're spending a lot of time with? Well, I'm really slow to the party, but I just downloaded Uber and look forward to my first Uber experience. That's awesome. Uh, so last question, a little bit embarrassing, but uh, helpful to all of us who've made mistakes on stage. Give, give us a highlight from the Warren Bird blooper reel. Uh, during my pastoring days, I confused the person that I was doing the funeral for and I, in my brain, had uh, a certain person in mind, and it was not the one whose body was there. And I described her, praised her, thanked uh, her, and and it was, you know, for specific things she had done for the church and all that. And it was just all wrong. <laughs> and uh, the nice thing is the family, nobody ever came up and teased me or or. Uh, jabbed me or threw stones at me. They were they were very very gracious. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they thought all oh all these discovered things I didn't know she <laughs> she worked in this area of the church. I don't know, but I just felt horrible. But she's with Jesus, and there are no more tears up there. Uh, so uh, I'm sure it's all worked. That's out. great, Warren. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's always a joy to visit with you. And uh, everybody, be looking out for Warren's next book. And if you haven't checked out next. Be sure and look at that. Uh, We'll talk to you again in the next episode. Thanks again for giving us your time. It's an honor to come into your life and get to share part of it with you. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. You can connect with us on Twitter at VanderblumenSG and hashtag your key takeaways with hashtag Vandercast. You can also receive more information about what we do here at Vanderblumen Search Group and notes from today's podcast at vanderblumen.com backslash podcast. See you next time.